Chapter 7 of Murder Madness by Mary Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The sun was sinking slowly when the plane appeared above the valley. There was only jungle below, jungle and the languid river, which now flowed sluggishly into a wide and shallow pool in which drowned trees formed a mass of substance, neither land nor marsh nor river. The river now contracted to a narrow space and showed signs of haste, and even foaming water, and then again flowed placidly onward, sometimes even a hundred yards in breadth. Shadows of the mountains to the west were creeping toward the opposite hill flanks, darkening the thick foliage and sending flocks of flying things home to their chosen roosts. The sound of the plane was a buzzing noise, which grew louder to a sharp drone as it seemed to increase in size and became a dull, monotonous roar as it dipped toward the waters of the stream. It floated downward, very gently, and circled as if regarding a certain spot critically, and resumed its onward flight. Again it circled, anxiously now, as if the time for alighting were short. It seemed to hesitate in midair, and dived, and circled upstream, and came down the valley again. It sank, and sank, lower and lower, until the white of its upper wings was hidden by the tall trees on either side. A Jabiru stork saw it from downstream, solemnly squatting on four eggs, which eventually would perpetuate the race. The Jabiru was about forty feet above the water, and had a clear view of the stream. The stork squatted meditatively, with its long, naked neck projecting above the edge of its nest. The plane dipped even lower, its reflection vivid and complete upon the waveless stream below it. Ten feet above the water, five, and swift ripples from the rush of air disturbed the unbroken reflections behind. It was almost a silhouette against the mirrored appearance of the sunset sky. And then a clumsy-seeming boat body touched the water with a vast hissing sound and settled more and more heavily, while the speed of the plane checked markedly and its motors roared on senselessly. Then abruptly the plane checked and partly swung around. The Jabiru half rose from its eggs. The motors were bellowing wildly again, as if tearing itself free. The plane sheared off from some invisible obstacle. One of its wingtip floats splashed water wildly, and while the motors, thundering to their fullest speed, it went toward the shore with a dragging wing like some wounded bird. It beached, and the Jabiru heard a sudden dense silence fall. A man climbed out of the boat-like body. He walked to the bow and dropped to the shore. He peered under the upward slanting nose of the boat thing. The Jabiru, listening intently, heard words. Then, quite suddenly and quite abruptly, and generally, with the unostentatious efficiency with which nature manages such things in the tropics, night fell. It was dark within minutes. The noise of Bell scrambling back onto the deck of the amphibian's hull could be heard inside the cabin. He opened the door and slipped down inside. There ought to be some lights, he said curtly. Ribiera did himself rather well, as a rule. He struck a match. Paula's eyes shone in the match flame, fixed upon his face. He looked about, frowning. He found a switch and pressed it, and a dome light came into being. The cabin of the plane, from a place of darkness comparable to that of the jungle all about, became suddenly a cozy and comfortable place. Well, said Paula quietly. Bell hesitated and took a deep breath. We're stuck, he said wryly. We must have struck a snag, or perhaps a rock just under water. Half the bottom of the hull's torn out. There's no hope of repair. If I hadn't given her the gun and beached her, we'd have sunk in midstream. 
Paula said nothing. Things are piling on us, said Bell grimly. In the morning, I'll try to make a raft. We can't stay here indefinitely. I'll hunt for maps, and we'll try to plan something out. But I'll admit that this business worries me, the plane being smashed. He passed his hand harassedly over his forehead. To have escaped from Rio was something, but since Paula had told him Ribiera's plans, it was clearly but the most temporary of successes. Cabinet ministers are not so commonplace but that the scandalous and horrifying crime that was imputed to Bell and Paula would be printed in every foreign country. Newspapers in Tokyo would include the supposed murder in their foreign news, and in Bucharest and even Constantinople it would merit a paragraph or two. Assuredly, every South American country would discuss the matter editorially, even where the master's deputies did not order it published far and wide. There would be pictures of Bell and of Paula labeled with an infamy. In every town of all Brazil, their faces would be known, and those who were the master's slaves would hunt them desperately, and all honorable men would seek them for a crime. Even in America, there would be no safety for them. The trade does not exist officially, and a member of the trade must get out of trouble as he can. And as an accused murderer, Bell would be arrested anywhere. As worse than a mere murderess, Paula... She was watching his face. This morning, she said queerly, you, you quoted, nil desperandum. Bell ground his teeth and then managed to smile. If it looked like I needed you to say that, he said coolly, I deserve to be kicked. Let's look for something to eat and count up our resources. The thing to do is, when you fall down, bounce. He managed a nearly genuine grin. Then, and to his intense amazement, she sobbed suddenly and bent her head down and began to weep. He stared at her in stupefaction for an instant, then swore at himself for a fool. Her father. Half an hour later, he roused her as gently as he could. It was helplessness, as much as anything else, that had made him leave her alone. But a woman needs to weep now and then, and Paula assuredly had excuse. Here's a cup of coffee, he said practically, which you must drink. You can't have had anything to eat all day, have you? The question had haunted him, too. She had been a prisoner in Ribiera's house for half an hour, possibly more, and Ribiera had in his possession and used a deadly, devilish poison from some unknown, noxious plant. Its victims took the poison unknowingly in a morsel of food or a glass of water or of wine, and for two weeks there was no sign of evil. And then the poison drove its victim swiftly mad, unless the antidote was obtained from Ribiera, and Ribiera administered the antidote with a further dose of poison. If Paula had eaten one scrap of food or drunk one drop of water while Ribiera's captive, she understood she looked up suddenly and read the awful anxiety in his eyes. No, nothing. She caught her breath and steadied herself with an effort of the will. I understand. You tried not to let me fear, but I ate nothing, touched nothing. I have not that to fear, at least. Drink this coffee, said Bell, smiling. Ribiera was a luxurious devil. There's canned stuff and so on in the locker. He was prepared for a forced landing anywhere. Flares and rockets will do us no good, but there are a pair of machetes and a sporting rifle with shells. We don't need to die for a bit, anyhow. Paula obediently took the coffee. He watched her anxiously as she drank. Now some soup, he urged, and the rest of this condensed stuff. And I found some maps, and there's a radio receiving outfit, if... Paula managed to smile. You want to know, she said, if I can endure listening to it. Yes, I, 
I should not have given way just now. But I can endure anything. Bell still hesitated, regarding her soberly. I've heard, he said awkwardly, that in Brazil the conventions... She waited, looking at him with her large eyes. I hope, said Bell, still more unhappily, to find this place Moradores, where you said you had some relatives. I hope to find it before dark. But before I landed, I knew I missed it and couldn't hope to locate it tonight. I thought... You thought, said Paula, smiling suddenly, that my reputation would be jeopardized, and you were about to offer... Bell winced. Of course I don't mean to act like an ass, he said apologetically, but some people... You forget, said Paula, with the same faint smile, what the newspapers will say of us, senor. You forget what news of us the cables have carried about the world. I think that we had better forget about the conventions. As the daughter of a Brazilian, that remark is heresy. But did you know that my mother came from Maryland? Thank God, said Bell, relievedly. Then you can believe that I'm not thinking exclusively of you, and maybe we'll get somewhere. Paula put out her hand. He grasped it firmly. Right, he said, more cheerfully than ever before. Now we'll turn on the radio and see what news we get. Into the deep, dark jungle night, then, a strange incongruity was thrust. Tall trees loomed up toward the stars. A nameless little stream flowed placidly through the night and, beached where impenetrable undergrowth crowded to the water's edge, a big amphibian plane lay slightly askew while a light glowed brightly in its cabin. More from that cabin there presently emerged the incredible sound of music, played in Rio for os gentes, of the distinctly upper strata of society, by a bored but beautifully trained orchestra. The Jabiru stork heard it, and craned its featherless neck to stare downward through beady eyes. But it was not frightened, Presently, instead of music, there was a man's voice booming in the disconnected sounds of human speech, and still the Jabiru was unalarmed. Like most of the birds whose necks are bald, the Jabiru is a useful scavenger, and so is tolerated in the haunts of men. And if man's gratitude is not enough for safety, the Jabiru smells very, very badly and no man hunts his tribe. Bell had been listening impatiently when a sudden whining, whistling noise broke into the program of very elevated music, played utterly without rest. The sound came from the speaker, of course. He frowned thoughtfully. The whistling changed in timber and became flute-like, then changed again nearly to its original pitch and tone. Paula was not listening. Her mind seemed very far away, and on subjects the reverse of pleasurable. Listen, said Bell suddenly. You hear that whistle? It came on all at once. Paula waited. The whistling noise went on. It was vaguely discordant, and it was monotonous, and it was more than a little irritating. Again it changed timber, going up to the shrillest of squealings, and back nearly to its original sound an instant later. Bell began to paw over maps. The plane had been intended for flight over the vast distances of Brazil, and there was a small supply of condensed food and a sporting rifle and shells included in its equipment. Emergency landing fields are not exactly common in the back country of South America. Here, said Bell sharply, here's where we are. It must be where we are. No towns of any size nearby. No railroad. No boat route. Nothing. Nothing but jungle shown here. He frowned absorbedly over the problem. What is it? asked Paula. Someone near, said Bell briefly. That's another radio receiver. 
an old-fashioned regenerator of set, sensitive enough and reliable enough, but a nuisance to everyone but its owner, except when it's a godsend, as it is to us. The music ended, and a voice announced in laboriously classical Portuguese, with only a trace of the guttural tonation of the karaoke, that the most important news item of the day would be given. Paula paled a little, but listened without stirring. The voice read, the rustling of sheets of paper was abnormally loud, and a bit of foreign news, and a bit of local news, and then... She was deathly pale when the announcement of her father's death was finished, and she had heard the official view of the police reported, exactly what Ribiera had told her it would be. When the voice added that a friend of the late Minister of War, the Senor Ribiera, had offered twenty contos for the capture of the fugitive pair, who had escaped in an airplane stolen from him, she bit her lip until it almost bled. I know, he said abstractedly. It is as you said, but listen to that whistle. The news announcement ceased. Music began again. The whistling abruptly died away. I just found some coil, said Bell feverishly, that plug in to take the place of the longer waved ones. I'm going to try them. It's a hunch, and it's crazy, but... There were sharp clickings. The radio receiver was one of those extraordinarily light and portable ones that are made for aircraft. In seconds, it was transformed into a short wave receiver. Bell began to manipulate the dials feverishly. Two minutes, three, four. The speaker suddenly began to whine softly and monotonously. Regeneration, said Bell feverishly on a carrier wave. It can't be far off, that receiving set. Suddenly a voice spoke. It was blurred and guttural. Infinitely delicate adjustments cleared it up. And then... Bell listened eagerly, at first in triumph, then in amazement, and at last in a grim satisfaction. Reports from Rio, on a shortwave band of radio frequencies, were passing from Ribera to some other place apparently inland. It was Ribera's own voice which quivered with rage as he reported Bell's escape. I do not think, he snapped in Portuguese, that full details should be spoken, even on beam wireless. I shall come to the fazenda tomorrow and communicate with the master direct. In the meantime, I have warned all sub-deputies in Brazil. I urge that all deputies be informed and instructed as the master may direct. Another voice replied that the master would be informed. In the meantime, the deputy for Brazil was notified. This list of bits of information chilled Bell's blood. This man, a Venezuela, had been denied the grace of the master by the deputy in Caracas. He would probably use the password and demand the grace of the master of sub-deputies in the state of Para to be seized and Caracas informed. The deputy in Colombia desired that the son of Colonel Garcia, upon a hunting party with friends in the Amazon basin, should be attached to the service of the master. His father had been so attached, and it was believed had smuggled a letter into the foreign mail warning his son. If possible, that letter should be intercepted. And from Paraguay, the deputy requested that the family of Senor Gomez, visiting relatives in Rio, should be induced to regard the service of the master as desirable. The orders ceased abruptly. Ribiera acknowledged them. The whining whistle cut off, and Bell turned to Paula, very grimly indeed. Pretty, isn't it? he asked, in vast calmness. Apparently, every nation on this continent has some devil like Ribiera in charge of the administration of this fiendish poison. Every republic has some fiend at work in it. And they're organized. My God, they're organized. 
the master seems to supply them with a mixture of poison and its antidote, and they report to him. Paula nodded. That was what my father had written down for you, she said quietly. Any man who can be lured to eat or drink anything these men have prepared is lost. He gains no pleasure, as a drug might give. He is entrapped into a lifetime of awful fear, knowing that a moment's disobedience, a moment's reluctance to obey whatever command they give, will cause his madness. I'm trying to think what we can work out of this, said Bell shortly. Some things are clear. There's a radio receiving set nearby, which listens to those short-wave reports, within five or six miles at most. We're going to find that tomorrow. And there's a central point, a fazenda, where one may talk directly with the master, whoever and wherever he may be. And judging by Riviera, my guess is that the master has the same hold upon them that they have on their underlings. Riviera is too arrogant a scoundrel to make obsequious reports if he were not afraid to omit them. He was silent for a moment, thinking. Then he said abruptly, Try to get some sleep if you can. The pistol of Riviera's, you have it handy? Keep it where you can reach it in the dark. I'm going to watch, though. Paula settled herself comfortably and looked queerly across the dimly lit little cabin at him. My friend, she said, with the faintest of quavering smiles, please do not reassure me. I have the courage of endurance, at least, and I do not fear you. It seemed to Bell, listening in the darkness that fell when he turned off the switch, that she stayed awake for a long time. But when she did sleep, she slept heavily. Bell had a raft of canes afloat beside the amphibian when she waked. He was sweat-streaked and bitten by many insects. He was tired, and his clothes were rags. But the raft was nearly twenty feet long. It would easily float two persons, and what small supplies the plane carried, and it could be handled by a long pole. Hello, he said cheerfully, when she climbed on top of the waterlogged hull of the plane. We're nearly ready to start off. I'm sorry. I can't advise you to try to refresh yourself in the river. There are some fish in it that are fiends. One of them took a slice out of the side of my hand. Piranhas, she exclaimed, and was pale. You should have known. Piranha are small freshwater fish of the Brazilian rivers, never more than a foot and a half long, which prove the existence of a devil. Where they swarm in schools, they will tear every morsel of flesh from a swimmer's body as he struggles to reach shore, and leave a clean stripped skeleton of a mule or horse if the animal should essay to swim a stream. I'll ask next time, said Bell ruefully. I'd planned a swim, but if you'll fix some coffee while I finish up this raft, we'll get going. I don't think we're far from some place or other. I heard what sounded suspiciously like a motor boat about dawn. She looked at him anxiously. Of course, said Bell, smiling. If the boat belonged to whoever listened in on the real broadcast and the shortwave news, he won't be especially friendly, though he should be glad to see us. But I've been studying the map, and I have a rather hopeful idea. Let's have coffee. He grinned as long as she was in sight, and when he went into the cabin of the plane, he seemed more cheerful still. But the idea of floating down this nameless little jungle stream upon a raft of canes was not one that he would have chosen. It was forced upon him. To travel through the jungle itself was next to impossible with a girl, especially as they were dressed for city streets and not at all for battling with dense and thorn-studded undergrowth. And to stay with the plain was obviously absurd. Sooner or later they had to abandon it, though the moment they did desert it they would be encountering not only the impersonal menace of the jungle, but the actual enmity of all the human race. The raft 
was the only possibility. It floated smoothly enough when they started off, with Bell working inexpertly with his long pole to keep it in midstream. He was, of course, acutely apprehensive. In country like this, a rapid could be expected anywhere. The jungle life loomed high above their heads on either side, and the life of the jungle went on undisturbed by their passage. Monkeys gaped at them, and exchanged undoubtedly witty comments upon their appearance. Birds flew overhead with raucous and unpleasant cries. Toucans, in particular, made a most discordant din. Once they disturbed a tiny herd of peccaries, drinking, which regarded them pugnaciously, and trotted sturdily out of sight as they came abreast. But for one mile, for two, the stream flowed smoothly, a third, and Paula pointed ahead in silence. A dugout projected partly from the shoreline. Bell wielded his long pole cautiously now, and drew closer and ever closer to the stream bank. Paula pointed again. There was even a small dock, luxury unthinkable in these wilds. The raft touched bottom, and suddenly, from somewhere out of sight, there came a horrible and bestial sound. It was a scream of bloodlust, of madness, of overpowering and unspeakable rage. Following it came crackling laughter. Paula went white. The facenda, said Bell softly, of the subdeputy who was listening in on Ribiera last night, and it sounds as if someone were very much amused. Some poor devil. Paula shuddered. I'm going ashore, said Bell, smiling frostily. There's nothing else to do. End of chapter 7